Welcome to Bookachino Live for June. We have so many really terrific books to share with you today, so let's get started. So we're going to start with books that are coming out this week, but first, your top picks from May, and it's always so much fun to see what you love best. Um, first, we've got Lisa C's Lady Tan's Circle of Women. Next, we've got Kristen Harmel's The Paris Daughter. Then Nancy Horan's The House of Lincoln. The Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club from Julia Bryan Thomas, The Postcard by Anne Barrest, and Drowning by T.J. Newman. I read Drowning the other day. It's a best of selection, as is Lady Tan, as is The House of Lincoln. So there you go, your top picks from May. Now we're going to ask your survey question. We asked a survey question last month. Are you still interested in reading books about World War II? And 44.4% said, yes, still read them. 30, almost 31% said yes, but it depends on the subject and the author. 20% said, I'm less interested in them than I used to be. And 7.4 said, I'm no longer interested in reading books in this time frame. So we love hearing feedback from you on what you're actually enjoying and what you're reading. So let's start with fiction. Going with Richard Ford's Be Mine, a Frank Bascom novel. It's out this week. It's from Pulitzer Prize winner Richard Ford comes a final novel in the world of Frank Bascom. Now in the twilight of life, a man who has accompanied many colorful lives, sports writer, father, husband, ex-husband, friend, real estate agent, Bascom finds himself in the most sorrowing role of all, caretaker to his son who has been diagnosed with ALS. On a shared winter odyssey to Mount Rushmore, Frank, in typical Bascom fashion, faces down mortality that is assured in each of us. In doing so, he confronts what happiness might signify at the end of days. Next, we've got Famous in a Small Town by Viola Shipman. This book had me eating cherries, cherries in celebration of his coming out yesterday. So let me tell you why. For most of her 80 years, Mary Jackson has endured the steady invasion of tourists influencers, and real estate developers who have discovered the lakeside charm of Goodhart, Michigan, waiting patiently for the arrival of a stranger she's believed since childhood would one day carry on her legacy, the very Cherry General Store. Becky Thatcher came to Goodhart to forget she just turned 40 with nothing to show for it. Ending up in the General Store with Mary is not the beach vacation she expected, but more the feisty auctionarian talks about destiny, the stronger Becky's memories of her own childhood holidays become, and the strange visions over the lake she never sure, were, were sure it were real. As she works under Mary's wing for the summer. She starts to believe that destiny could be real. And yes, cherries figure into this book. There's a cherry pit spitting contest at the beginning, and I just have to tell you, the woman's spitting in a general store. I just have to tell you, I haven't tried that in my office. Next up, we've got The Favor by Adele Griffin. Uh, this is gonna be a summer reading title contest next week. Um, at I'll Have Seconds, the high-end fairy tale vintage dress shop in Manhattan, Nora Hammond loves nothing better than pairing a rare find with the perfect client. At home, she grapples with the bleaker reality of enormous debt, a tiny apartment, and an ever-dwindling hope that she and her husband, Jacob, will have a family of their own. When socialite Evelyn Elliott charges into Nora's life, the woman sparks an intermediate connection and Nora is jettisoned into the heady world of New York's moneyed elite. As Evelyn's stylist and confidant, Nora needs to learn all the rules of engagement for the uber wealthy, but it isn't until Adele, Evelyn decides her next cause is to carry a baby for Nora that these rules and this unlikely friendship are tested started reading this the other day, and I have to say, Evelyn is over the top. Nora's normal. Now we've got the Five Star Weekend by Ellen Hildebrand. For many people, Ellen Hildebrand signifies that summer has begun. How a shortest life seems picture perfect. She's the creator of the popular food blog, Hungry with Hollis, and she's married to Matthew, a dreamy heart surgeon. But after she and Matthew get into a heated argument one snowy morning, he leaves for the airport and is killed in a car accident. This cracks in Hollis's perfect life. Her strange marriage and her complicated relationship with her daughter, Caroline, grow deeper. So when Hollis hears about something called a five-star weekend, 
one woman organizes a trip for her best friend from each phase of her life, her teenage years, her 20s, her 30s, and midlife, she decides to host her own five-star weekend, but the weekend doesn't turn out to be a joyful Hallmark movie. So there you go, five-star weekend. Next, we've got Night Bloom by Peace Adzo Mehdi, and it's out this week. When Celestine and Akorfa were young girls in Ghana, they were more than just cousins. They were inseparable. They would do anything for each other, imploring their parents to let them be together, sharing their secrets, desires, and private jokes. Then Selassie begins to change, becoming hostile and quiet. Her grades suffer. She built a space around herself, shutting Akorfa out. Meanwhile, Akorfa accepts, is accepted at an, Indian, an American university with the goal of becoming a doctor, always hopeful that she could create a, a fuller life as a woman in America, she discovers the insidious ways that racism plays obstacles in her path once she leaves Ghana. It takes a crisis to bring the friends back together with Selassie's secret revealed and Akorka uh, forced to reckon with her role in their estrangement. I think this is a beautiful cover. I just think there's something like any really fabulous about it. Next, we've got Susan Mallory, The Happiness Plan. It's on sale on June 20th. Heather has a successful business, a cute but contemptuous cat, and best friends Daphne and Tori. So why does she feel crushed when her ex gets serious about someone new? More connections will hold her together while her world falls apart. So she finally reaches out to the stranger who might be her dad. Daphne isn't having an emotional affair, despite what her husband believes. He started the rift in their marriage when he said they weren't ready for a baby. Can they find their way back to one another? When Tori forms an inconvenient crush on Daphne's brother-in-law, she suppresses her feelings until her apartment floods and she moves in with the dog-loving doctor. If things go wrong, she could lose her friends. But if they go right, she could lose her heart. So there's The Happiness Plan by Susan Mallory. Next, we've got Welcome to Beach Town by Susan Wiggs, coming on June 20th. An idyllic Alara Cove, the California beach town known for its sunny, char sunny charm and chill surfer vibe, it's graduation day at the elite Thornton Academy. At Thornton, the students are worldly and overindulged children who live in gated enclaves with spectacular views. But the class Victorian is Nikki Graziola, a surfer's daughter who is there on scholarship. In the shock of everyone in the audience, Nikki veers off script while giving her a commencement address and reveals a secret that breaks open the whole community. Her accusation shakes the foundation of Alara Cove pitting her against the wealthy family whose money runs the town. Her new notoriety sends Nikki into exile for years, where she finds fame, but not fortune, overseas as a competition surfer until a personal tragedy compels her to return to Alara Cove. Next up, we've got Banyan Moon by Fao Thai. It is coming on June 27th. When Anne Tran gets the call that her fiercely beloved grandmother, Mean, has passed away, Life's already at a crossroads. In the years since she last saw Min, Anne has built a seemingly perfect life, but it all crumbles with one positive pregnancy test. Now she returns home to Florida to face her estranged mother, Huang. Huang is simultaneously mourning her mother and resenting her for having the relationship with Anne that she never did. Then Anne Huang learned that Min has left them both in Banyan House, the crumbling old manor that was Anne's childhood home. Under the same roof, for the first time in years, mother and daughter must face simmering questions of their past and their uncertain futures, while trying to rebuild the relationship without the one person who's always held them together. That's Banyan Moon. Next, we've got Little Monsters by Adrian Bedore. It is coming on June 27th. Ken and Abby Gardner lost their mother when they were small. Their father, Adam, is a brilliant oceanographer who raised them mostly on his own. Ken is now a successful businessman with political ambitions and a picture-perfect family. And Abby is a talented visual artist who depends on her brother's goodwill, in part because he owns a studio where she lives and works. As the novel opens, Adam is approaching his 70th birthday. He's always managed his bipolar disorder with medication, but he's determined to make one last scientific breakthrough. So he secretly stopped taking his pills. Meanwhile, Abby and Ken are both harboring secrets of their own. And there's a new person on the periphery of the family, Steph, who doesn't make her connection known. 
So there we've got little monsters. The Wife App is by Carolyn Mackler. Known Carolyn for years as a YA author. I'm really interested to see her book because she writes very clever, clever books. So I'm looking forward to The Wife App. It's on G coming on June 27th. Lauren, the mother of twins, stumbles on a dirty secret that explodes her marriage. When Madeline learns that she might lose her child to her ex in England, it stirs up a decades-old personal tragedy. Sophie obsesses over her ex-husband's family 2.0 all while keeping true desires hidden, even from herself. Starts as a joke, one tipsy night out, as Lauren, Madeline, Sophie reel against everything wives do for free. Let's build an app that monetizes the mental load and maybe get revenge on our exes in the process. Soon the wife app is born, and before long, it's the fastest growing startup in New York City. But when life intervenes, love intervenes, ex-husbands intervene, and the consequences are bigger than anything Lauren, Madeline, or Sophie could have expected. So this is Every Wife Deserves Her Own Happy Ending. Love that. Now we've got The Better Half, which is from Allie Frank and Asha Humans. You may remember that I absolutely love these two authors because they have a great sense of humor as they write. After a difficult five years, Nina Morgan Clark's time has finally arrived. With an ex-husband relocated across the country, her father bouncing back after the loss of his beloved wife, and her daughter, Alexandra thriving in boarding school, Nina is stepping into her dream job as a trifecta, a first-generation Black female head of the storied Roy Royal Hawkins School. To mark the moment, Nina and her best friend, Marisol, take a long overdue girls' trip to celebrate the second half of Nina's life, which is shaping up to be the best half of her life. As Nina's school year gets underway, all seems to be progressing as planned. Before long, wonder hire Jared Jones relentlessly pushing, pushes Nina to her ethical limits. Soon after, dutiful Zandra accuses one of her teachers of misconduct. Most alarmingly, the repercussions of her trip with Marisol force Nina into a life-altering choice. So there we've got the better half. We've got historical fiction. So first, we've got one of your favorites we know, The Spectacular by Fiona Davis, and it's on sale this week. So in New York in 1956, when 19-year-old Marion Brooks came across an opportunity to audition for a Radio City Rockettes, she jumps at the chance to exchange her predictable future for the dazzling life of a performer. Meanwhile, the city is reeling from a string of bombings orchestrated by a person the press has nicknamed the Big Apple Bomber. With the public in an uproar, the police turn to Peter Griggs, a young doctor who espouses a new radical technique, psychological profiling. As both Marion and Peter find themselves unexpe unexpectedly pulled into the police search for the bomber, Marion realizes that if she hopes to catch the culprit, she'll need to stand out and take a terrifying risk. In doing so, she may be forced to sacrifice everything she's worked for, as well as the people she loves the most. Next, we've got The Brightest Star coming from Gail Sukiyami. Uh, at the dawn of a new century, America is falling in love with silent movies, including young Wong Tu Song. By 11, Wong Lu is determined to become an actress and has already chosen a stage name, Anna Mae Wong. At 16, Anna Mae leaves high school to pursue her Hollywood dreams, defying her disapproving father and her Chinese traditional upbringing. After a series of nothing parts, 19-year-old Anna Mae gets her big break and her first taste of Hollywood fame, starring opposite Douglas Fairbanks in The Thief of Baghdad. Yet her beauty and talent isn't enough to overcome the racism that relegates her to supporting roles. Though she suffers pro professionally and personally, Anna Mae fights to win lead roles, accepts risque parts, financially support her family, and keep her illicit love affairs hidden. There's the brightest star. Next we've got Hotel Laguna from Nicola Harrison. It's coming on June 20th. 1942, Hazel Francis left Wichita, Kansas for California, determined to do her part for the war effort. At Douglas Aircraft, she became one of many Rosie the Riveters, helping to construct bombers for the US military. But now the war is over, men have returned to their factory jobs, and women like Hazel have been dismissed. Unwilling to be forced into a traditional woman's role in the Midwest, Hazel finds herself in the bohemian town of Laguna Beach. 
I love Laguna Beach, by the way. Uh, desperate for work, she accepts a job as an assistant to the famous artist Hanson Radcliffe. But Hazel still wants to work with airplanes and maybe even learn to fly one someday. Torn between pursuing her dream and the dream life she's always been granted, she's unsure if giving herself over to Laguna is what her heart truly wants. Next, we've got the first ladies, and I know you love these two authors. We've got Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. You know them as the authors of The Personal Librarian. It's coming on June 27th. The daughter of formerly enslaved parents, Mary McCled Bethune refuses to back down as her white as white supremacists attempt to thwart her work. She marches on as an activist and an educator, and her reputation grows. She becomes a celebrity. Eleanor Roosevelt is eager to make Mary's acquaintance. Initially drawn together because of their shared belief in women's rights and the power of education, Mary and Eleanor become fast friends. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected president, the two women begin to collaborate more closely. Eleanor becomes a controversial first lady for outspokenness, particularly in civil rights. And when she receives threats because of her strong ties to Mary, it only fuels the woman's desire to fight together for justice and equality. Next, we've got some thrillers and mysteries. First is The Drowning Woman by Robin Harding. It's out this week. Early one morning, Lee Gulliver sees a sobbing woman throw herself into the ocean. She hauls the woman back to the surface, but instead of appreciation, she's met with fury. Hazel tells her that she wanted to die, that she's trapped in a toxic, abusive marriage, that she's a prisoner in her own home. Out of options, Hazel retreats to her gilded cage, and Lee thinks she's seen the last of her, until her unexpected return the next morning. Bonded by disparate but difficult circumstances, the women soon strike up a close and unlikely friendship. And then one day, Hazel makes a shocking request. She wants Lee to help her disappear. It'll be easy, Hazel assures her, but Lee soon, Lee soon learns that nothing is as it seems, and Hazel may not be the friend Lee thought she was. There's the drowning woman. Next, we've got Inside Threat from Matthew Quirk. Um, the White House has been breached. The president is forced to flee to a massive doomsday bunker outside D.C. to defend against whatever comes next. Only the most trusted agents and officials are allowed in with him. Among them is Eric Hill, who's given his life to the Secret Service. Despite his growing disillusionment from seeing Washington corruption up close, Eric can't ignore years of instincts honed on the job. Government's under attack, and there's no one better to face them, face them down the threat than he is. Evidence leads him to a conspiracy at the highest levels of power. As a killer strike inside the bunker, it will take everything Eric has to save his people, himself, and his country. Next, we've got The Long Way Back by Nicole Bart. Um, William Ken Kruger, I know he's another friend, a favorite author of yours, said calls it extraordinary, another sparkling gem. And her last book was one of my bets on selections, so I'm looking forward to this. It's out this week in paperback. Mother and daughter, Charlie and Eva, never saw, sought social media fame. But when a stunning photo of Eva went viral, fame found them. Now, after more than two years documenting life on the road, the duo has temporarily settled on the north shore of Lake Superior. Eva's happily finishing her senior year of high school and applying to college, but Charlie longs for the adventures they left behind. When Eva goes missing less than a week before her graduation, it's Charlie who immediately suspects, is, is suspected of foul play not just by their fans, but also by the police and the FBI. As a fight about one more road trip comes to light and the truth about the relationship is questioned, Charlie realizes the rosy facade that they portrayed online hid a comp complicated and potentially dangerous reality. When we have too many people living on social media as influencers and whatever, social media fame, enough already folks, let's see what really happens here. Next, we've got The Puzzle Master by Danielle Trucioni. Um, Once a promising Midwestern football star, Mike Brink was transformed by a traumatic brain injury that caused a rare medical condition, acquired savant syndrome. The injury left him with a mental superpower. He can solve puzzles in ordinary ways, that, in ways ordinary people can't, but also left him deeply isolated. Everything changes after Brink meets Jess Price, a woman serving 30 years in prison for a murder 
who hasn't spoken a word since her arrest five years before. When Price draws a perplexing puzzle, her psychiatrist believes it will explain her crime and calls Brink to solve it. What begins as a desire to crack an alluring cipher quickly morphs into an obsession with Price herself. She soon reveals that there's something more urgent and dangerous behind her silence, thrusting Brink into a hunt for the truth. That's a really cool cover too. The puzzle master. You know, we are going to have an, um, an evening event in the fall with cover designers. I've just got to get some work going on that this summer to figure out when we're going to do it and which designers we're going to invite. But I'm absolutely fascinated by covers, and I want to do something to share that with you as well. Next, we've got What Remains by Wendy Walker. This is one of our summer reading titles, and it's out this week. Detective Elise Sutton has dedicated her life to creating a sense of order at work with her ex-Marine partner, at home with her husband and two daughters, and within battling her own demons. Lisa's everything under control until one afternoon, when she walks into an apartment store and is forced to make a terrible choice. To save one life, she'll have to take another. She's hailed as a hero, but she doesn't feel like one. She's steeped in guilt, and on leave of absence from work, she's numb, even to her husband and daughters, until she connects with Wade Austin, the tall man whose life she saved. But she soon realizes he isn't who he says he is. In fact, Wade isn't even his real name. Tall man is a ghost, one who will set off a terrifying game of cat and mouse, threatening Elise and the people she loves most. Next, we've got Riley Sagers, the only one left. Hope family murders shock the main coast one bloody night in 1929. While most people assume that 17-year-old Lenora was responsible, the police were never able to prove it. Lenora's never spoken publicly about that night, nor has she set foot outside Hope's End, the cliffside mansion where the massacre began, or, I'm sorry, occurred. It's now 1983 and home health aide Kit McDear arrives at a decaying Hope's End to care for Lenora. Confined to a wheelchair, Lenora is rendered mute by a series of strokes and can only communicate with Kit by tapping out sentences on an old typewriter. One night, Lenora uses it to make a tantalizing offer. I want to tell you everything. As Kit helps Lenora write about the events leaving, leading to the Hope family massacre, it becomes clear there's more to the tale than people know. This is a striking reminder to me of one of my favorite books of the year, Homecoming by Kate Morton. Next, we've got The Spare Room by Andrea Bartz coming on June 20th. Kelly's new life in Philadelphia has turned into a nightmare. The only bright spot is her newly rekindled friendship with her high childhood friend, Sabrina now a glamorous, best-selling author with a handsome, high-powered husband. When Sabrina and Nathan offer Kelly an escape hatch, volunteering the spare room of the remote Virginia mansion, she jumps at the chance to run away from her old life. There, Kelly secretly finds herself falling for both of her enchanting hosts, until one night, a wild and unexpected threesome leads the couple to open their marriage for her. First, she loves part of being part of this risque new world. But when she discovers that the last woman they invited to their marriage is missing, she starts to wonder if they could be dangerous and she might be next. This is three chairs by the pool. Next, I know another favorite of yours is Ruth Ware. She wrote The It Game and The It Girl and The Woman in Cabin 10. It's on sale on June 20th and it's called Zero Days. Hired by companies to break into buildings and hack security systems. Jack and her husband, Gabe, are the best penetration specialists in the building. But after a routine assignment goes horribly wrong, Jack arrives home to find her husband dead. To add to her horror, the police are closing in on their suspect, Jack. Suddenly on the run and quickly running out of Jack options, Jack must decide who she can trust as she circles closer to the real killer. You know, one of the times when I do these programs, I'm gonna give you like words you have to see, how many times they're mentioned. And in this one, I would probably be doing how many women have men's names, okay? So Jack and her husband, Gabe, okay, there's Jack, there was Charlie before. I think next time I'm, I'm gonna have like some quiz. I'm gonna figure out some quiz. Tom and I are gonna to have to come up with this, so we'll see what happens. Next, we've got Her Too from Bonnie Kistor. I loved Bonnie's last book, and I am looking forward to this, which is on sale on the 4th of July. Kelly McCann is a high-powered lawyer whose specialty is defending men accused of sex crimes, falsely accused, she always maintains. Her detractors call her a traitor to her gender. She doesn't care. 
The story opens she secured an acquittal for a renowned scientist accused of sexually assaulting his female employees. The thrill of her victory is short-lived. That night, she too falls victim to a brutal sex of sexual assault. Almost as horrific as the attack is the fact that she can't tell anyone it happened, not without destroying her career in the process. Joining forces with her rapist's other victims, the shrewd lawyer plans to turn the tables on him. It's not only about justice. These wrong women are out for revenge. But someone, it seems, is out for them. And one by one, they find themselves facing even greater danger. There's her too. It's, her too. it's coming out in paperback on sale July 4th, and it'll be a summer reading um, titled The Week of July 10th. And yeah, 10th. There's that for a memory. Okay, next is memoirs, biographies, and nonfiction. We've got two. First is Never Give Up, a Prairie Family Story by one of my favorite journalists, Tom Brokaw. Okay, here's a little story. I'll be perfectly honest to admit with you guys. Last night that he was on NBC, he was on the Jumbotron. The NBC News ran on the Jumbotron. And I knew it wouldn't make it in time. So I actually drove down there and watched the sign off there. And I confess, I cried in my car because I really thought he was like a genuinely fabulous broadcaster. So here's what his story is. Tom Brokaw's father, Red, left school in the second grade to go to work in the family hotel, the Brokaw House, established in Bristol, South Dakota, by R.P. Brokaw in 1883. Eventually, through work on construction jobs, Red developed an exceptional talent for machines. Tom's mother, Jean, was the daughter of a farmer who lost everything during the Great Depression. Although they didn't have much money early in their marriage, Red's philosophy of never give up served them well. Big break came after World War II when he went to work in the Army Corps of Engineers, building great dams across the Missouri River. Late in life, Red surprised his family by recording his memories of the hard times of his early life, reflections that inspired this book. So you would also know um, Brokaw is the uh, author of The Greatest Generation. Evidence of Things Seen is edited by Sarah Wyman, who is absolutely brilliant at doing true crime works. So I really want to see what she's pulled together here. It's coming on July 4th. True crime as an entertainment genre has always prioritized clear narrative arcs. Victims wrongs, police detectives in pursuit, suspects apprehended, justice delivered. But what stories have been ignored? In evidence of things seen, 14 of the most icon the innovative crime writers today cast a light on the cases that give crucial insight into our society. Wesley Lowry writes about a lynching left unsolved for decades by an indifferent police force and a family's quest for answers. Justine Vandeloon reports on the thousands of women in prison for defending themselves from abuse. Mae Jiang reveals how the, how the out, uh, Atlanta spa shootings tell a story of America. This anthology pushes back the curtain on crime, how crime itself is a byproduct of America's systemic harms and inequalities and in doing so, it reveals how the genre of true crime can be a catalyst for social change. Now we've got August titles to look forward to. I don't know about you, but I think this has been a year of so many books coming out that I want to read, and I am so far behind on my reading. Let's start with the Connollys of County Down. The Tracy Lang, it's coming on August 1st. Tara Connolly is reduced from prison after serving 18 months on a drug charge. She knows rebuilding her life at 30 years old won't be easy. With no money and no prospects, she returns home to live with her siblings, who are both busy with their own problems. Her brother, a single dad, struggles with the ongoing effects of a brain injury he sustained years ago. Their sister's fragile facade of calm and order is cracking under the burden of big secrets. Life becomes even more complicated when the cop who put her in prison keeps showing up unannounced, leaving Tara to wonder what he wants for her now. While she works to build a new career and hold her family together, Tara finds a chance at love in a most unlikely place. But when the Connolly secrets start to unravel and threaten her future, they all must face their worst fears and come clean or risk losing each other forever. Next we've got Naomi Hirohara's Evergreen, a Japantown mystery. Um, her last book, Clark and Division, this actually picks up where that one left off. And if you didn't read Clark and Division, you can read this one on its own. But if you have a chance to read that before August 1st, I highly recommend it. It was a bet on. I interviewed her, and it's a really terrific book. It's been two years since Aki Ito and her family were released 
from the Manz uh, Manzanar Detention Center and resettled in Chicago with other Japanese Americans. Now the Edos have finally been allowed to return home to California, but the entire Japanese American community is starting from scratch, with thousands of people living in dismal refugee camps while they struggle to find new houses and jobs in overcrowded Los Angeles. Aki is working as a nurse's aide in a Japanese hospital in Boyle Heights when an elderly Aki man is um, admitted with suspicious injuries. She seeks out a son. She's shocked to recognize her husband's best friend, Bobby Wadabe. Could Bobby be uh, guilty of the elder abuse? Only a few days later, Little Tokyo is rocked by a murder at the low-income hotel where the Wadabees are staying. What secrets have they been hiding? And can Aki protect her husband from getting tangled up in a murder investigation? And uh, Lisa C. has called this uh, accurate heart rendering a real eye-opener. Sarah Pekinen wrote Gone Tonight, and it's coming on August 1st. Catherine Sterling thinks she knows her mother. Ruth Sterling is quiet, hardworking, and lives for her daughter. All her life, it's been just the two of them against the world. But now Catherine is ready to spread her wings, move from home, and begin a new career. And Ruth will do anything to prevent that from happening. Ruth thinks she knows her daughter. Catherine would never rebel, would never question anything in her mother's past or about her mother's past or background. But when Ruth's desperate quest to keep her daughter by her side begins to reveal cracks in Ruth's carefully constructed world, both mother and daughter begin a dance of deception. From Sandra Brown, my August floating pool read, we've got Out of Nowhere coming on August 1st. Perfect timing. At Texas County Fair, children's book author Elle Portman is enjoying a rare night out with her two-year-old son, Charlie. Just as they're about to head home, a shooter opens fire into the crowd. Also caught in the melee is corporate consultant Colger Hudson. He's frustrated and confused when he wakes up in the hospital after undergoing emergency surgery on his arm. The doctor tells him that he was lucky. As far as gunshot wounds go, he pulled through remarkably well. Others weren't so lucky, which instills Calder a huge, furious determination to get justice, a goal shared by Elle. Their chance encounter at the police station leads to a su surprising and inexplicable gravitation to one another. But even as the attraction grows, Elle and Calder can't help but wonder if the unimaginable tragedy that brought them together is too painful and too complicated to sustain, especially while the shooter remains at large. Next, we've got Pulling the Chariot of the Sun by Shane McRae, and I heard him talk about this story. So interesting. It's coming on August 1st. When Shane McRae was three years old, his grandparents kidnapped him and took him back home to suburban Texas. His mother was white and his dad was black. And to hide his blackness from him, his maternal grandparents stole him from his father. In the years that followed, they manipulated and controlled him, refusing to acknowledge his heritage, all the while believing they were doing the best for him. For their own safety and to ensure that the kidnapping remained a success, Shane's grandparents had to make sure he never knew the full story, so he was raised to participate in his own disappearance. But despite elaborate fabrications and unreliable memories, Shane begins to reconstruct his own story and to forge his own identity. Gradually, the truth unveils itself, and with the truth comes a pain to path to reunite, reuniting with his father and finding his own place in the world. It's an amazing story. It's a memoir of a kidnapping. Next, we've got Tom Lake from Ann Patchett coming on August 1st. It's interesting. Um, as you all know, Ann Patchett is a bookseller. She owns a bookstore in Nashville. And she um, decided this was a pub date she wanted August 1st because she said that summer is still going on and there's a lot of people that still are looking for books to read. And she wanted to come out in August so that she'd be another summer read that people could pick up at that time of year. So we're back in Cherryland, folks. Ultimately, another reason for me to be eating cherries. Spring of 2020, Lara's three daughters return to the family's orchard in northern Michigan. While picking cherries, they beg their mother to tell them the story of Peter Duke, a famous actor with whom she shared both a stage and romance years before at a theater company uh, called Tom Lake. As Lara recalls the past, her daughters examine their own lives and relationship with their mother, and they're forced to reconsider the world and everything they thought they knew. Here's Tom Lake, and this has got such a pretty cover. But no cherries. Look at the cherries. 
Next, we've got California Golden coming from Melanie Benjamin on August 8th, Southern California, 1960. In an era where women are expected to be housewives, Carol Donnelly breaks the mold as a legendary female surfer struggling to compete in a male-dominated sport, and her daughters, Mindy and Ginger, bear the weight of her unconventional lifestyle. The Donnelly sisters grew up enduring their mother's absence, both physically and emotionally. To escape questions about her whereabouts and to chase her elusive affection, they cut school to spend their days in the surf. From the first time on a board, Mindy's a natural, but Ginger, two years younger, goes out of place in the water. They grow up and their lives diverge. Mindy and Ginger's relationships ebbs and flows. But through it all, their sense of duty to each other survives, and they are forever connected by the emotional damage they carry from their unorthodox childhood. Um, Melanie's uh, book, The Children's Blizzard, was one of my bets on selections. I am looking forward to reading this one. Okay, so now we've got two books that had surfers in them. We're doing one of our quiz uh, by, by uh, little uh, quizzes. That would be one of the questions as well. Next, we've got None of This is True by Lisa Jewell. It's coming on August 8th. Celebrating her 48th birthday at her local pub, popular cod podcaster Alex Summer crosses paths with an unassuming woman called Josie Fair. Josie, turns out, is also celebrating her 45th birthday. Two days later, Alex and Josie bump into each other again, this time outside Alex, uh, Alex's children's school. Josie's been listening to Alex's podcast and thinks she might be an interesting subject for the series. Josie's life appears to be strange and complicated. And though Alex finds her unsettling, she can't quite resist the temptation to keep making the podcast. Slowly, she starts to realize that Josie has been hiding some very dark secrets. Before she knows it, Josie has inveigled her way into Alex's life and into her home. As quickly as she arrives, Josie disappears. Only then does Alex realize that her life and her family's lives are under mortal threat. Who is Josie Fair and what has she done? They've got Shark Heart, a love story by Emily Haybeck. I heard her talk about this book a couple of months ago as well. Um, it's August, coming on August 8th. For when Lewis and Wren, their first year of marriage is also their last. A few weeks after their wedding, Lewis receives a rare diagnosis. He will retain most of his conscious memories um, and intellect, but his physical body will gradually turn into a great white shark. As Lewis develops the features and impulses of one of the most predatory creatures in the ocean, his complicated artist heart strains, struggles to make peace with his unfulfilled dreams. At first, Wren internally resists her husband's fate. And then a glimpse of uh, Lewis's developing carnivorous nature activates her long repressed memories for Wren, whose stories vacillate between her childhood living on a houseboat in Oklahoma and her time with a college girlfriend and her unusual friendship with a woman pregnant with twin birds. Woven throughout the novel is the story of Wren's mother, Angela, who becomes pregnant with Wren at 15 and an abusive relationship amidst her parents' crumbly marriage. In the present, all of Wren's reef eventually collides and she's forced to make an unfortunate and impossible choice. If I remember correctly, the author's husband has had a debilitating issue over the last years, not this one, but he's had a debilitating issue, and she was um, forming sort of that into her head as she was writing. I'm fairly sure that's true, and I promise to look it up. Invisible Hour is coming from Alice Hoffman on August 15th. This is an author that usually publishes in October. She's publishing now. Um, Chris and Hannah call this a fantastic mystical journey that celebrates the joy and power of reading and dares uh, to believe in the impossible. One brilliant June day when Mia Jacob can no longer see a way to survive, the power of words saves her. The Scarlet Letter was written almost 200 years earlier. This seems to tell the story of Mia's mother, Arv Ivy, and their life inside the community, an oppressive cult in Western Massachusetts where contact with the outside world is forbidden and books are considered evil. But how could Nathaniel Hawthorne have so perfectly captured the pain and loss that Mia carries inside her? Through a journey of heartbreak, love, and time, Mia must abandon the rules that she was raised with at the community. As she does, she realizes that reading can transport you to other worlds or bring them to you and that readers and writers affect one another in mysterious ways. She learns that time is more fluid than she can imagine, and that love is stronger than any chains that bind you. Next from Karen Slaughter, we've got After That Night. Coming on August 22nd, 
15 years ago, Sarah Linton's life changed forever when a celebratory evening out ended in a violent attack that tore her world apart. Since then, Sarah's remade her life. Successful doctor, engaged a man she loves, finally able to leave the past behind her. Till one evening on a call in the ER, everything changes. She battles to save a broken young woman who has been brutally attacked. As the investigation progresses, led by GBI Special Agent Will Trent, it becomes clear that Danny Cooper's assault is uncannily linked to Sarah's. The past isn't going to stay buried forever. Next, we've got Jennifer Weiner. Jennifer usually pubs in um, May. It's pubbing on August 29th this year. Um, she has been enjoying um, being a bicyclist. She's been biking long, long, long trips um, around and um, vacation and just to get out there and kind of push herself. So this book has some inspiration, has given, that has given this book some inspiration. 34-year-old Abby Stern has made it to a happy place. She's at peace with her plus-size body, at least most of the time. And she's on track to marry her childhood sweetheart, Mark. Mark. Yet she can't escape the feeling that something isn't right or the memories of a one mind-blowing night spent with a man named Sebastian two years ago. So when Abby at the last minute called the leader's group bike trip from New York City to Niagara Falls, she's happy to have time away from Mark and a chance to make up her mind. But on the first night, that first day, she's shocked to see Sebastian in the tour group. That would be fun. To make things even more worse, there's a last minute addition to the trip Abby's mother, Eileen, whom Abby blames for a lifetime of insecurities she's still trying to undo. So over the next week, strangers become confidants, hidden truths come to light, a teenage girl with a secret will unite all the writers in, writers in surprising ways while all of Abby's uncertainties about herself, her mother, and the nature of love are challenged. The breakaway. Now, I'm really surprised that there's no bike. Oh, there's a little bike on the cover. Okay. Good Bad Girl by Alice Feeney. I always love Alice's book. She rests with rock, paper, scissors. Um, 20 years ago, after a baby is stolen from a stroller, a woman is murdered in a care home. Two crimes are somehow linked, and a good girl, good bad girl may be the key to discovering the truth. Edith may have been tricked into a nursing home, but at 80 years young, she's planning her escape. Patience works there, cleaning messes and bonding with Edith, a kindred spirit. But Patience is lying, at, at, is lying to Edith about almost everything. Edith's own daughter, Cleo, won't speak to her. And someone new is about to knock on Cleo's door, and their intentions aren't good. With every reason to distrust, distrust each other, the women must solve a mystery with three suspects, two murderers, and one victim. If they do, they just might be able to find out what happened to the baby who disappeared, the mother who lost her, and the connections that bind them. There you go, good bad girl. Next, we've got Learned on the Heart by Emma Donahue, which is coming on August 29th. Drawn on years of investigation and Anne Lister's five million word secret journal, Learned from the Heart is the long buried love story of Eliza Rain, an orphan heiress banished from India to England at age six, and Anne Lister, a brilliant, troublesome tomboy. Eliza and Anne meet at the Manor School for Young Ladies in New York in 1805, when they are both 14. Next step. Okay, these are our Father's Day books. You have to enter this contest by Friday at noon. These are fantastic books. We've got Harlan's Coben's I Will Find You, King of Life by Jonathan Eng, Laws of Wrath by Eric LaSalle. Yes, he is the guy from TV. Yes, and he, he was really interesting talking about the book. Linwood Barclay's The Lie Maker, A Nazi Conspiracy by Brad Meltzer and Josh Mensch, and David Baldacci is simply wise. You've got to enter to win these six books. You can win them for your dad. You can pretend you're giving them to your dad. Give them to yourself. Give them to yourself and later give them to your dad. I will take it any way. Enter on the site and you have to enter by Friday at noon. And I have five boxes all packed up here of the books that we're giving away. So all I need to put is names on top of them of the winners and they're going out the door. This time every book is here and we are ready. Okay, we've got our summer reading titles. Make sure you peruse through these for some great summer reading ideas. Remember, we're doing our 24-hour giveaways on select days this summer. Here are some notable June paperback releases. That Carrie Soto is Back by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I love this book. It taught me about tennis. 
Now, Tom Donati, who's our tennis expert, and I can once in a while talk about tennis, and I constantly am still trying to figure out what each of the terms are, but I'm doing better, folks. And we've got The Family Remains by Lisa Jewell, Latecomer by Jean Hamp Korowitz, Amazed by Nelson DeMille, Tracy Flick Can't Win by Tom Parada, which is also at that sign, and Louise Penny, A World of Curiosities. I've picked 17 bets on selections so far this year. These are the 17. Actually, there'll be two more that I'll be adding soon, which is um, Lisa C's um, uh, which the Lady Tan's uh, Circle of Women, and also the, um, uh, Carol, you're losing mine, uh, Nancy Horan's uh, The House of Lincoln. So they're real terrific. They're really, real terrific. Every one of these books I've completely enjoyed. Um, we've done a number of recent interviews. Uh, what up this week was Nancy Horan's The House of Lincoln. Very interesting. She grew up in Springfield, why she was so interested in Lincoln, and Lisa C's Lady Fan Circle of Women. Both really, really terrific. Oh, actually, all four of these interviews are great. And I want you to pay attention to Alice Elliott Dark, who I interviewed for about an hour and a half when we spoke with her, because we're going to be doing something special. We're not going to be doing our Book of Chino Live book group over the summer. We know a lot of people are traveling, so we're not going to be doing that in June, July, and August. But on Wednesday, September 27th at 8 o'clock, we are going to have Alice Elliott Dark on discussing Fellowship Point. And what's going to be interesting about her doing this is um, she's always wanted to do a big, deep discussion into a book. It's a thick book, folks, which is the reason we're giving up plenty of time to read it. But I thought this book was beautiful. I picked it as a bets on selection last year. It's available in paperback. For book clubs, we're actually going to be doing a giveaway about this on um, reading group guides. But just wanted you to be aware that this one's coming September 27th. Get reading now. Um, also, what we're going to do is instead of a Book of Chino Live book group event at the end of June, I'm going to do a special Book of Chino Live evening program, preview of books releasing this summer we think you'll enjoy reading. I'm actually going to do some of the ones that came out a little bit earlier in the year as well. It's going to be an evening event. Those of you who attend in the afternoon, if you want to pass along to friends that aren't always available for our afternoon events, and we're going to weigh it in. I'm trying to think of some fun ways to pull these together. We'll be doing that in the next couple of weeks. So that will be pulled together as well. Um, our next Book of Chino Live preview event will be a preview of books we're re releasing from July 11th to August 1st and a peek ahead of September. It's going to be Wednesday, July 12th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And we look forward to having you join us there. So for those who are joining us on, um, later for this event, Thank you so much for joining us, everyone, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time for Book of Chino Live Book Group.